Hello, and welcome to the next lecture from the History of Christian Worship Practices. This is John Shulcote, Worship Professor at Nebraska Christian College. We will begin our discussion on worship in the Middle Ages. For the content of this course, we will talk about worship between 600 AD to 1500 AD, all being considered part of the Middle Ages, although some other historians would have a narrower view of the Middle Ages. For our content and our purposes, we're going to look at this 900 years of the church's history. To begin our conversation today, I actually want to tell you a story about the guru's cat. A traditional part in the Indian culture, an ashram is a spiritual center where people would go to meditate and sit in the presence of their spiritual teacher or their guru. So this is the story of the guru's cat. Once there was an ashram in Kathmandu, Nepal, where a guru lived with many disciples. Also living in this ashram was a cat. He was a wonderful cat, a very friendly and eager to please cat. The cat was well fed and well loved by everyone in the ashram. There was only one problem. During the ashram daily schedule, the cat wanted to participate, and the cat's participation began to disrupt the hours of chanting and meditation for the guru and the disciples. Why so? When the guru and the disciples would chant, the cat would howl. When they would meditate, the cat would snore quite loudly. Therefore, the guru asked every day during chanting and meditation the cat to be tied to a post in another room. The disciples obeyed the guru's command and the disciples of the daily schedule was uh, the discipline of the daily schedule was restored. There was no more disruption for the cat and everyone's focus was again strong on chanting and meditation. A few years passed and one auspicious day the guru peacefully left his body. The disciples continued to tie the cat to the post every day during the periods of chanting and meditation. One day the sweet cat died. The disciples held a meeting and discussed how important it was to preserve the guru's teaching. With resolve, they went to the market and bought another cat so that they could tie it to the post during the times of chanting and meditation and in this way faithfully honor the guru's teaching. So when the guru sat down to worship each evening, he would tie the cat up. And after the guru died, the disciples continued to tie the cat up. Well, when the cat died, they decided that they needed a new cat so they could tie the cat up because that was part of the ritual. And centuries later, learned treatises were written by the guru's disciples on the religious and liturgical significance of tying a cat up while the worship was performed. Depending on how long you have attended your current church, you may have found that over the years it has developed a certain way of doing worship. Certain things are usually done at the same point in the service. The pastor tends to say the same thing leading into communion offering or welcome time. These traditions may have started out with no intention of permanence, but more out of necessity, but permanence was the result. There may be traditions or rituals that are just as significant as tying a howling cat to a post. And these are the traditions and rituals that you must go back and ask, why do we do these things? What are the important reasons for the origin of this practice? And are those reasons still worth our time and our attention today? And then are the practices and rituals that we do still resulting in the same expression of worship that we initially thought they would, or do we need to change them? Today, we will begin talking about the Middle Ages. This is a huge span of time, about 900 years. From the church, this period is split into two sections divided by the Great Schism. So from 600 to around 1100 AD, we see uh, the early section of the Middle Ages, and then after this Great Schism, around 1100 A.D. to 1500 A.D., we see the second period. Uh, 
uh, where we have the Eastern and Western churches separated. Christianity began with a lot of freedom in regards to form. As we saw, communion and baptism were the only two forms that seemed to have some structure built in from Scripture. The church was free to use other forms of worship as they saw fit, language, music, architecture, etc. However, as time went by, less freedom and more control was the natural flow of worship history. This occurrence was more pronounced in urban areas. In rural areas where bishops traveled less frequently, the church had more freedom. But certain population centers began to develop their own set forms of worship, and over time, these liturgical centers began to exert more and more influence over geographical areas. By the Middle Ages, the following areas were becoming known for their specific worship styles and forms. In the eastern half of the Roman Empire, we see the churches of Antioch, Alexandria in Egypt, and Jerusalem. And then in the western half, we see Rome and Carthage, which is in northern Africa. Over the years, cultural, religious, and political differences developed between the eastern and western centers. Eventually, the Great Schism occurred in 1054 A.D., forever separating the two groups. In general, Eastern worship practice places a greater emphasis on the use of icons and symbols. They also tend to be more philosophical, abstract, and mystical in their thinking, while the Western church tends to be more pragmatic and legal-minded. The Western Church becomes the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church that we are used to understanding today. Centered in Rome, in the city of the Vatican City, and expanding throughout the entire culture. While the Eastern Church are known as the Orthodox Churches that we will talk about later in the another lecture. The church in Carthage, in northern Africa, did not survive much past the 8th century because of the invasion of the Muslims. Consequently, the Roman tradition began to dominate the West and became the center of the Western church. One of the main developments during this period was the class of professional worshipers, or the monastic orders. These monks, uh, professional worshipers, one thing they would do would be to say the psalms every week. The entire psalter would be repeated. As we read in the Rule of St. Benedict, chapter 18, it says, The psalter, with its full number of 150 psalms, should be chanted every week and begun again every Sunday night at the night office. For those monks show themselves too lazy in the service to which they are vowed, one chant less than the psalter, together with the customary canticles or other songs, one chant less in the course of a week since we read that our Holy Fathers strenuously fulfilled that task in a single day. Over the centuries, the Psalms were provided with a number of supplementary texts. It became customary, for example, to frame the Psalms with antiphons. Antiphons were brief passages that helped to bring out the Christian significance of the old Jewish texts. The antiphons were joined by a variety of prayers, canticles or songs, hymns, readings from the Bible, and dialogues. These desperate elements were arranged in a repetitive structure that varied in its detail depending on the time of day, the day of week, and the season of the year. And a liturgical calendar was used to keep track of all of the days and all of the seasons. And rubrics were employed to indicate exactly what words were to be said when. The result was a new and more complex known book that was known as the Breviary. The Breviary then was an expanded instruction book on worship for priests and monks to be able to say all the prayers and read the scriptures and express throughout the different mass services what they needed to in order to fulfill their worship experience and expectations. So it was arranged in a repetitive structure, and it did vary depending on the time of day, week, and the season of the year. 
But because of this, a liturgical calendar developed when you knew the different seasons, you knew what you would pray, for instance, during Lent, as opposed to an ordinary time or Advent, and what songs and psalms to be sung. In the Gothic period, and especially in the 13th century, there was a strong desire on the part of lay people to imitate the devotional practices of monks and nuns. The breviary was far too complex for use for lay people, so they developed a simpler book called the Book of Hours, which, though resembling the breviary, was far less variable depending on the seasons and the time of day and the day of the week. Therefore, it was quite easy to use. As we look at the life of the monk, we're going to no doubt look at the daily office in more detail. Uh, the daily office were prayers and devotions that were primarily and actively only for the monks because it was so time-consuming for the average Christian. It, most monks would spend up to six hours each day literally in prayer. As we read from the rule of St. Benedict to chapter 16, he had a plan for eight daily services that was developed in the 500s, and they lasted until 1960. We read as he wrote, The sacred number of seven will be fulfilled by us if we perform the offices of our service at the time of mourning, prime, terse, sext, of known, of vespers, and of compline. Since it was these day hours that the psalmist said, Seven times a day do I praise thee. However, it was eventually developed into an eighth time, an eighth hour. So we started at the middle of the night with the nocturne, the vigils or the matins, followed by daybreak, the lauds, and then soon after daybreak, prime. Mid-morning would be the terse, noon would be sext, the hour of non would be mid-afternoon, vespers is at the end of the workday at the sunset, and then before bedtime, the compline. Here are a couple uh, links that you can go to view life within the monastic order and some understanding of um, worship in the Middle Ages, especially the experienceforworship.org.uk, where they have done a great extensive research in understanding the mass of the uh, 1200s, 1300s. You can watch actual reenactments and depictions of different types of worship times and mass services. These links are also found online in Canvas. As we talk about monks and professional worship, one of the main things that we see, the monks begin to develop so many components of our worship. They specifically developed melody, hymnody, and instruments. Not only masters in music, but they were also masters in science, art, literature, botany, and chemistry. These monks not only studied scripture, but they studied uh, the world around them. 
This concludes our lecture on the Middle Ages and the Western Church, including the development of professional worshipers or the monastic orders, the daily offices, and the Roman liturgy of the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist.